Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Bernoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And guys, it's very late here in the Czech Republic. And I thought about putting this particular news broadcast off till tomorrow because it is so late. But then I got to thinking that, you know, Ukraine could break into a major war at any moment. And then I'd be afraid that you would never know the truth of what's really going on in Ukraine. And because of if the war breaks out uh, before I could get this broadcast put out, you will never hear the voices. You would never know the witness because the whole world's media would be embroiled with what's going on in Ukraine. And of course, the United States very much backs the western part of Ukraine whereas Russia is trying to, at a distance, help eastern Ukraine. There's all types of propaganda going on. I have watched it. We have shared it with you here. Even the U.S. Uh, ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Mr. Uh, Gre uh, I believe his name is Gregory, he clearly, it's very obvious he is siding with western Ukraine. Putin even though the eastern Ukrainians have wanted to become part of Russia, he has distanced himself from that. Even though he has taken with Crimea, he allowed them a referendum, they were allowed to, to secede back into it. But Putin has distanced himself from eastern Ukraine other than helping them uh, with armaments. Even lately, as we have reported here on Israeli News Live, he has even sent more tanks to them to help them in a battle that is about to turn ugly. Now the bad thing is, is I'm afraid that there is so much help from NATO that when Poroshenko this time attacks Eastern Ukraine, unless Russia does step in there, it's going to be a total genocide of these people in Eastern Ukraine. Another thing I found interesting is I've done my research on Eastern Ukraine any type of news, any type of videos, it is extremely hard to get them and them not be blocked by YouTube and other different medias, Facebook as well, social media. They have blocked a lot of the things that, they're, that are coming out of Eastern Ukraine. Because why? These are the pro-Russians. They are, when I say pro-Russians, it's because they speak the Russian language. I saw the paperwork of the referendum. How many people voted? Upwards to 80 plus percent of these people in eastern Ukraine voted for autonomy, not because Russia had invaded Ukraine, because the United States was backing a coup to overthrow Ukraine. And when they saw this coming, they knew it was not good for them. You have to understand, it's a major religious war. And what I'm about to tell you tonight is something that Many channels are getting shut down for even mentioning the possibility of what the war in Ukraine really is about. It is Rome versus Russia, but not Russia, Putin Russia, but the Russian Orthodox Church. I don't say that one is greater than the other by no means, but I do see it is more of a religious war. And one thing that really caught my attention on this was because as I have done my own research, I see both sides very much involved with their religious faith. The Roman Catholics that are in Western Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox in Eastern Ukraine. It has became, become a true war of religion. And, but the same, at the same time, the lies and the propaganda from the Western media, including the United States, very much pro-Roman Catholic side, they could care less about the Russian side. So we're never told the truth. When we are told, as we brought on the broadcast yesterday and the day before, Russian media quoting UN statistics, making it sound like Ukraine citizens being killed in the war by Russians, when in fact it was Petro Poroshenko, his Ukrainian soldiers that were killing Eastern Ukrainians. That's what the UN report brought out. These are the civilians that are being killed. And yet at the same time, Poroshenko makes it look as if there is no citizens living there. There are no people there. They have evacuated and it's only Russian soldiers that they are confronted with. I've seen the reports and it's very sad. Some of the images you may see could be disturbing in this broadcast, so I do advise, even now, before we get to this part of the broadcast, 
any children not to be watching this broadcast. Let's begin. And I want you to hear the voices of the Eastern Ukraines as well and what they're going through. Let's first look at the religious side of this. The Catholic roots of Obama's activism from the New York Times on March 22nd, 2014. I want you to just see how deeply embedded we are in a religious war because it has everything to do with world leaders. And we already know Joe Biden is an Orthodox, Roman Orthodox Catholic uh, believer. Okay, he's just buried into it. In fact, Hillary Clinton's own nom uh, nominee, Kane, which kind of is interesting. You have trumpets, kind of like sounding the alarm that Kane is running for vice president. Hmm, interesting. Kane had a mark on him that no man should do anything to him. Wonder if that could carry down in a significant religious aspect for today. I don't know. Anyway, Chicago, in a meeting room under Holy Name Cathedral, a rapid group of black Roman Catholics listened as Barack Obama, a 25-year-old community organizer, trained them to lobby their fellow delegates to a national congress in Washington on issues like empowering lay leaders and attracting more believers. He so quickly got us, said Andrew Like, a participant in the meeting, who is now the director of the Chicago Archdiocese Office for Black Catholics. The group succeeded in inserting its priorities into, into, the, into Congress's plan for churches. Mr. Like said, Barack Obama was key in helping us do that. The Catholic roots of Obama's activism continue on in the same article. He, Obama, had arrived two years earlier to fill an organization position paid for by a church grant and had spent his first months here surrounded by Catholic pastors and congregations in this often overlooked period of the president's life. He had desk in a south side parish and became steeped in the social justice wing of the church, which played a powerful role in his political formation. Hmm. Didn't know that, did you? There's been a lot of Roman Catholic things that have happened in the United States, especially since Ronald Reagan was president. Remember that? The Time, magazine, Time Magazine's Holy Alliance? Well, if you want to read the entire article, you will have to pay for a subscription with Time Magazine to see everything. It's also kind of interesting that it was around Olympic time. Magical moments in Albert, uh, Albertville. And again, we're at Olympic time. What's going to happen now? Only President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were present in the Vatican Library on Monday, June 7, 1982. It was the first time the two had met, and they talked for 50 minutes in the same wing of the Papal Apartments. Augustino Cardinal Casaroli, uh, uh, Archbishop Acville Sil Silvestrini, met with Secretary of State Alexander Haig and Judge William Clark, Reagan's national security advisors. Most of their discussions focused on Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Then in its second day, Haig told them Prime Minister Menachem Begin had assured him that the invasion would not go farther than 25 miles inside. Isn't it kind of odd that they're talking to the Pope of Rome about how far the invasion is going to be for Israel? By the way, all of Ronald Reagan's aides during that time of his presidency, even though he was not Catholic himself, every aide he had was a Roman Catholic. That's kind of odd, isn't it? Well, another thing that was interesting, too, is the very fact that the Soviet Union actually broke up with hardly no protest, and there was no bloodshed. My wife grew up in the Soviet Union. She lived under communism. What you're going to find out later in the broadcast, communism was brought in by the Jesuits themselves. It was done in order to stamp out the Russian Orthodox Church, the Eastern form of believing in none other than Jesus Christ. You see, Russia has not always been a communistic nation. Some people don't even know that. Some people have no idea why it became communistic. Why did Lenin and Stalin push this ideology? It's pretty obvious, and you're going to find out a little bit more. This is why it was so easy to bring it down. 
There was a reason behind it. It was only meant to be this way for a certain period of time, and it may help you to understand why there is such a major conflict in Ukraine going on right now by the end of this broadcast. Let's continue on. I'd like for you to hear this here. This is only a couple of, a few seconds interview here where President George Bush is being asked about Pope Benedict and what does he see when he looks into his eyes? Well, he was asked about looking into the uh, Russian leader's eyes. Watch what he says. Oops, sorry about that. You look in Vladimir Putin's eyes, he said, you said you could look into his soul. But then he asked him, when you looked into Benedict, Pope Benedict's eyes, what do you see? Without hesitation, he says, God. Do you remember the famous quotes by President Bush there when he talked about going to war with Iraq? He said, God told him to go liberate them. Go give them their freedom etc. Just keep these things in mind. Let's move forward here. How the Russian-Ukraine war is being fought by churches. This was on World Religion News July 29th of 2014. The Ukraine Orthodox Church is suffering from internal and external pressure. The separatists who wish to see Ukraine return to Russian control have caused a divide in the church using their faith to bolster their political beliefs. They have styled themselves as the Russian Orthodox Army. And they have interesting plans for the nation. By uniting the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the state, the separatists believe that they will help create a third Rome between Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. By the way, the reason why they call it a third Rome was because many, many years ago in the history of Russia, Moscow was actually considered Rome III. That right there happens to be on uh, the article called How the Russia-Ukraine War Was Being Fought by Churches, World Religion News, July 29th, on, their, on that article there. All right, but let's continue on. Another article here. This is on the telegraph.co.uk, May 3rd, 2016. That's just a couple of months back, a few months ago, right? Two years after war broke out in Ukraine, the death toll continues to mount. In the early hours of last Wednesday, two shells fell amongst the vehicles near a separatist checkpoint just south of Donetsk, where all the problems are right now, guys killing four civilians, including a pregnant woman. Both sides blamed one another for the attack. Observers from the OSCE special monitoring mission who, attention this, who attended this scene said crater analysis indicated two 122mm artillery shells banned under the ceasefire agreement had been fired from a west-south-westerly direction. While the mission explicitly refrains from assigning blame for such incidents, that is the direction of the Ukrainian-controlled territory. Now, here's what's odd. It is the Ukrainians right now, and even in the, uh, it was posted by the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine that works at the embassy there. He posts where the Ukraine is saying that the Russians are the ones using and have brought in the 122 millimeter artillery shells. But the evidence falls right back on the Ukrainians, not the Russians. Now, I'm not saying that the Russians haven't sent in some pretty big stuff as well. We know they have. We know they've sent tanks. But Israeli News Live, we have seen over and over and over where Ukraine themselves from Kiev through Petro Poroshenko, it is their group that is initiating all the first attacks, first of everything. And while he claims that their civilians are not there, yes, they are. Now, the next little piece I'm going to show you is going to be a, a, a clip. This is an American man. He's in East Ukraine, East Ukraine, by the way, is where the separatists are, the ones that are, want their own autonomy because they know what Poroshenko and his neo-Nazi thugs will do to them. They will massacre them. 
I've seen so much video footage, guys, it'll make you sick to see what they have done to civilians. This isn't doctored up videos or nothing. It's a fact. And I'm going to show you, and at the end of the broadcast, I will show you video footage. Excuse me, not video. I will show you satellite footage that you can go look at for yourself. You don't believe the Ukrainian government doesn't attack civilian areas? I will show you just how devastating they are to people in their own private homes. Let's take a look at what this man says here. Only a few seconds of it. You know what's the truth. You're in America. You vote for Obama, you vote for Bush, you vote for Hillary Clinton. What kind of person are you to do that? This is your responsibility. We're like, Americans are like the good Germans that supported Hitler and they said, we don't care what Nazis do in other countries. We just have our jobs. We just want to watch sports and drink beer. This is a war for the future of mankind. And you decide which side you're on. Are you going to be on the side of the people that do this? If not, now is the time to make your move. Now is the time to decide you're going to do more than just hit like on a Facebook page. Now is the time to go to the street. Now is the time to stand up. To say no more, no more murder, no more terrorism. That the United States backs for the, the Nazis here. This is what's happening every day in Ukraine. The Nazis that the United States backs are murdering civilians here. That's right. What are you going to do about it? In case you did not hear or understand what he says, he is an American man. He's traveled to eastern Ukraine, and he's devastated by the deaths that the Obama administration is backing right now. He knows that if Hillary Clinton gets into office, it's only going to be more. It's a neo-Nazi government that they put, put in. And of course, that neo-Nazi government went straight to the Vatican and visited with Pope Francis right after they were put in by the Obama regime. Now, we see all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. And as he said, what are you going to do? He even tells you it's neo-Nazis that are backed by the U.S. government right now that are killing civilians. Let's take a look at just some of what he's talking about. This first video clip right here is very moving. It's hard to hear. I'll read to you the subtitles as these little children talk. He says, hello. How are you? I'm doing good. What is that? It's a grod. Grod missile where? Yes. After the first bang, I said, let us run away. No other choice. After one explosion was there, another one there, and one more there and everywhere. One bomb hit exactly the home. The bombing were so intense that I felt strong pressure in my ears. The shootouts, the missiles flew over our heads. Now I know the real heart pain. I sat here in the window when the bomb hit our house. I was sitting near the window when the bomb hit our house. We moved quickly to the door of the house. And over there, a kitten was hit with a bomb. When the attack was over, I saw that my son and my mother and grandmother were lying here on the ground. The dead body of the grandmother. I took the kids, ran into the basement. Later, under the flashlight, I had seen the hand of my child. Yesterday, when I was carrying my son from the destroyed house, he told me, Mom, I have just started. When I had seen my mom and dad, they were lying on the ground. I was simply afraid to look on them. Please tell me why you never say truth. Doesn't kill us, but these fascists who are around our city do this. Let me. Let's do this. Let me pause it for a second. Let's take a look. I'll have to kind of go slow, guys, because it's kind of difficult. I want you to see it go. It's a rapid paced video. But let's take a look at this. Oh, sorry about that. Let's take a look at it now, guys. Так 
Now, the little boy is showing him a grad missile, is what he's showing. That missile came in and I believe struck his house. Yes, and he says, were you attacked? He said, yes. After this first bang, I said, let's run away. No other choice. One explosion was there, another one there, and one more there, everywhere, explosions. That's what these little children are going through. And she said, one bomb hit exactly my home. Now, you know, my wife is sitting here and listening to this because they're speaking in Russian, and she speaks Russian fluently. The bombs, the bombing were so intense that I felt strong pressure in my ears. I missed that one. The missiles flew over our heads. Now I know the real heart pain. I sat near the window when the bomb hit our house. We moved quickly to the door. The house was collapsing. And over there, a kitten was hit by a bomb. Splinters. When the attack was over, I saw that my son, my mother, and grandmother were lying here on the ground. And the dead body of my grandfather was lying there. I took the kids and ran into the basement. Later, under the flashlight, I'd seen the hand of my child. One finger was cut off. Yesterday, when I was carrying my son from the destroyed house, he told me, Mom, I've just started to live. Why? Like this. When I had seen my mom and dad, this boy just his tears dripping from his eyes. They were lying on the ground. I was simply afraid to look on them. Please tell me why you never say truth. DNR doesn't kill us, but the fascists who are around our city do this. Now see, what is that? What is the DNR? That's the that's the 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 Donetsk. It's the National Republic. That's that's the people that are trying to do self autonomy. And she's angry about it too. But the fascists, Poroshenko wants war. He doesn't understand peace. Poroshenko has betrayed us, but I want peace anyway. People should come to peace, even if they disagree with each other. No war should happen again. Assume they finish all of this tomorrow, and then the war will never happen again. Never, never, never. And this is what they go through at night. Bombs after bombs after bombs after bombs. Mommy, please, I'm so afraid. But there's nothing they can do about it. I want to share this one with you as well. Again, I'm trying to give you some insight of what's happening to these people here. Where are they shooting from? A tank, she asked. That is, this is horrible. Not a single shell landed. Let me turn the volume down a little bit because I need you to be able to, I want to translate. Save Donbass people, the one girl holds the sign. Now this goes on for quite some time here, this video. Um, she says, the house exploded. 
besides civilian populations. Whose grandmothers had heart attacks today? Ambulances were overloaded. And so on and so forth. I think of it like this. Here's a message to the Ukrainian. You came here to fight a war on the east of Ukraine for money. He says, you aren't going to earn that much. You'll earn it yourself for a zinc coffin. They'll, pay that. They'll pack you in a bag and drive you away. Don't you remember that you also have children, parents? What if we go there? What will happen then? We don't need Western. We don't even go there. We don't want to go there. They came to us themselves. When there was a flood in Western Ukraine, we collected money to help them. Now they're collecting money to bomb us. We had referendums, spoke out our opinion. Without corpses and shells, humanely, what do you want from us? What do you want from us? Everyone spoke out officially. 90% don't want to coexist with fascists. Don't want to deal with you. Today, peaceful civilians in Voldokka and five in the morning were hiding children in basements. My godmother lives there. I called today at 5 a.m. Everyone is in shock crying. They say, what do we do? We're in the same situation. On the weekends, I gave out my daughter with my father. They drove to Vovodovka. To, to the country house to stay overnight. They called in the morning and said, mines or shells are flying over us. Like all of that is flying from, uh, yes, our city wasn't hit. This isn't the first time. They didn't hit it. And I don't think that they will stop. This was shelling on locality. Next, it will be firing on the city and the block post, and who knows where they'll shoot next. If they fire at a plant, none of us will be here after six minutes. So what will happen next? We don't know. What is this all being done for? What is it for? All of us are terrorists. The two republics that broke away, all of them are terrorists, all seven million, right? I don't get it, or what? Let them read the definition of terrorism, at least something. Some kind of instructions to something, how to use shells and everything else. They bombed the central square in Lugansk and tell us it was a conditioner. A missile works from 2,000 degrees. What conditioner? Let them buy a brain from America, any kind, at least a part of a brain. I'm a resident from Severodonetsk. Uh, I lived here for 27 years. I would like to address Ukrainian mothers from Western Ukraine who are sending their sons to the Ukrainian army, who then come here to shoot. Understand that same people are here. You should ask the government not for bulletproof vest. You need to require to stop taking your children and bringing them here. This is a uh, fratridical war. You must require them to withdraw your sons and stop it. And don't listen to Kiev's government who say that they are not children here and that nobody died here. Yes, nobody had died from Severodonetsk, yet it's just the outskirts that are, going, that are being bombarded. 
But you know it is all BS. That they say terrorists blew themselves up in Lugansk. You know. Terrorist. There's such an impression that since Kiev's government came to power, there's some kind of su a suicide. A people of the southeast, they blow themselves up, they burn themselves up, and so on. I ask Ukrainian mothers to think and not to send your sons here and require the government to withdraw them and not ask for bulletproof vest. How Turkonoi is giving out a command. Tur Tur I, I still can't pronounce that guy. He's the guy that is the head of the Ukrainian military. He is the one that said they're going to attack these people. They're ready to launch an attack. So does Poroshenko shoot them and that's it? And it was said on TV, don't pity children, nor women, nor senior citizens, nobody. Can you believe that? They said on their TV, on Ukrainian television, Pershinko says, and it is said on TV, don't pity children, nor women, nor senior citizens, nobody. I wanted to say, I wanted to say that my children woke up today at four in the morning with screams because of what happened today. And I also wanted to say that nobody evacuated us. And even if we get a chance to leave somewhere, they make us go back. Just, la just like in uh, Slavyanovsk, where mothers with children are taken back, only a few are leaving, just a few have this opportunity to, to go or to leave. It is terrible when your child wakes up with screams and is afraid that it was before today when it started from uh, Rebizania because of all this stress and negative. It's all on me, on my husband, on my family. They always listen to it. This uh, zello constantly. I can't turn it off. And I simply can't take my child away from it. Mi minimally. Minimally. So that she wouldn't listen to all it because I myself am afraid that if I wouldn't listen to it, then I'll miss out on something. Nobody evacuated us. All of us live here. I ask you to all give attention regarding the evacuation of children from Severodonetsk. See, now look at this. This here, guys, is the children walking down the street. Children are walking. Nobody evacuated the people. They are walking on the streets peacefully and calmly. Those are preschoolers. Excuse us. Okay, that's just to give you a little idea of what the people are going through. Now, I want you to see another clip here. And this one is probably the most moving. And then I'm going to close out with a few more comments about Russia's history and, and where this is coming from as far as a religious war. This is where a bomb hit and they're rescuing a little boy from where the Ukraine government shooting bombs and shells constantly into these regions here. The little boy just so happened to be alive after the attack. It just doesn't end, guys. This was a little documentary that I picked up that they had put together. Little boy playing the violin. And then they're going to start showing you pictures of the children that have died in this war. All these little kids that have died for what, a religious war? I mean, this is terrible. There's no war that's good, and I realize people have died also on the other side as well. I realize that. But you know, if they would just give these people their autonomy, this would end tomorrow. 
These people have no desire to go to Western Ukraine. They have no desire. There would be no bombing, no more problems. But our media in America makes it look like our media is making it look like that they are the aggressors, that Russia's in there doing something. Did PBS seem to find this out when they were there documenting what's happening? No. These people are just being massacred. Is it because they want to conquer Russia because Russia doesn't want to be part of this new world order? You know, I saw this child here that just showed in your screen there. I, I see the blue eyes. I think of, I think of Adolf Hitler. And I, and, I, and I had to ask myself, well, he's got blue eyes, doesn't he? What's the purpose of all this? What's the purpose for killing all these children? Bombing their homes. I'm going to show you a little bit of something here. They're going to show you again the pictures of those little children that have died. Different, not different, I'm sorry, same, same children there. It's sad what's happening there, guys. Very sad. You know, a lot of times, guys, we think of Russia as just being a communistic nation. As I said to you earlier, though, communism began when the Jesuits decided they were going to stomp out the Russian Orthodox Church. And I don't say that one is more perfect than the other. If we believe that Jesus Christ is truly the Messiah, why do we need to kill each other? Because we have a difference of opinion. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte, it is believed that he was an actual Jesuit that was sent to stomp out the Russian people, the Russian Orthodox faith, in fact. And this guy right here, what you see here, this is, this is not, um, this here is the Tsar Alexandria, Alexander the Tsar. When Napoleon reached Moscow and set the city on fire, the Tsar had a mighty spiritual awakening which showed him the true nature of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Jesuit against Russia, on the website www.reformation.org is where you can find this article. They write in here, Alexander went forward with his army in a state bordering on religious ecstasy. That's what they're saying about Alexander the Tsar here that you see pictured on your screen. That when Napoleon in 1812 attacked Russia, he used French soldiers. He could care less about the French. He was British himself. But he used the French soldiers and he invaded Russia. He got all the way to Moscow and he burned the city to the ground. Back then they had Tsars or like a Caesar, so to speak, of Russia. And this man right here, Alexander, went forward with his army in a state of bordering on religious ecstasy. More and more, he turned to the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel with the apocalyptic vision of how the all-conquering king of the south is cast down by the king of the north. It seemed to him as if the prophecies which had sustained him during the dark days of autumn and early winter were now being fulfilled. Easter this year would come with a new spiritual significance of hope for all Europe. Placing myself firmly in the hands of God, this is what he says, placing myself firmly in the hands of God, I submit blindly to his will. I informed, uh, he informed his friend uh, Golestin from uh, Rod Zono, Zonal on the uh, Worka. My faith is sincere and warms with passion. Every day it grows firmer, and I experience joys as I had never known before. It is difficult to express in words the benefits I gain from reading the scriptures, which previously I knew only superficially. 
all my glory I dedicate to the advancement of the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was in the book called Tsar of War and Peace on page 260. You see, Russia has not, not always been an atheistic country. That, was, that only happened after they murdered the last Tsar's family. Not, now Alexander was murdered as well. Let me just share with you one other thing here. When Napoleon reached Moscow and set the city on fire, the Tsar had a mighty spiritual awakening which showed him the true nature of Napoleon Bonaparte. That's what we're reading from. Inspired by his newfound faith, Alexander proposed a holy alliance of peace and Christianity charity among all the states of Europe. This, this is after he chases Napoleon all the way back. He goes all the way back to France to Paris, France, and he defeats him, defeats, defeats uh, Napoleon. The monarchy was restored when the Bourbon King Louis VIII assured the Tsar that he would respect the constitutional rights of the French people. That's interesting. Only Great Britain, and by the way, let me read this to you here. Only, uh, he, he inspired by his newfound faith, Alexander proposed a holy alliance of peace and Christian charity among all states of Europe. Only Great Britain, the Vatican, and the Turks refused to sign. You know what's odd? Everybody looks at Vladimir Putin as the communistic guy. But you know what? They talk about he looks back to the glorious days of communism. But Vladimir Putin expresses his faith in Jesus Christ. I don't say that his way of believing is perfect by no means, but what is interesting, he's not afraid to name the name of Jesus, whereas every politician in America will never say the name of Jesus publicly. Oh, they might say, I'm a Christian. They might even say God, but they will never pray in that name or the name Yeshua. Either way, Putin at least does. So he's not a atheistic leader. He's actually more like Alexander, the Tsar that defeated Napoleon. Now, I also notice with Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia today, he's trying to make peace with the West. He's tried to make peace, but nobody seems to want it. A few do, but every time that some of the EU members want to have peace with Russia, they're quickly something bad happens in their country. Have you ever noticed that? When Merkel began to kind of backpedal a little bit and wanted to lift the sanctions on, on Russia, the plane mysteriously crashes. Of course, they blame it on a terroristic act, and it, was a, it just so happens to be this guy that's uh, an Arab guy, and he wanted to kill everybody on the plane on a plane that has the autopilot thing to where they can take over the plane from any terrorist and fly at any airport and land it safely? Uh, sure. You think we really believe that? Not everybody. Anyway, the great Tsar was absolutely horrified by the slaughter of the Napoleonic Wars, so he proposed a treaty of friendship among all the European states and called the Holy Alliance. This alliance was to install the Christian virtues of charity and peace in Europe, European political life. Now watch this. This is the Russian leader, guys. In conjunction with the British Bible Society, he arranged for the trans translation and distribution of the scriptures throughout Russia. This also earned the Tsar the undying hatred of the Jesuits. They didn't want the Bible in print to the people. The Holy Alliance and the distribution of the scriptures ended with the untimely death of the Tsar by poisoning on December 1st, 1825, the Russian city of Tag Taganrog. And then, of course, we have the Russians turn atheistic with, of course, Lenin. The cover for the Russian Revolution was the atheistic Marxist Lenin. It is easy to tell, though, that he was a Jesuit, that he was behind the revolution because the communists adopted the Pope's Gregorian calendar, and it was only Roman Catholic churches that flourished in the Soviet Empire. Now, that's not written in the article. That is something I do know. 
They stomped out any and every other religion that there was. They tried to totally annihilate the Russian Orthodox Church. My wife has given me her own testimony. She was accepted, or, or they were trying to get her into medical school, her own um, professors from school because she was, uh, had a genius IQ, extremely high, like a, I think it was 140 IQ. She had a passion for medical. She excelled in biology and other things like this. And she was going to be accepted in medical school, but she was from a different faith. And because she was in a communistic regime, atheism was what flourished. And when they knew that she came, and she was a former Jehovah's Witness at the time, she left that organization when she found Christ, when Christ came to him himself. Jesus actually came to her one day. And she got saved and walked away from that organization. But what was really interesting, there was a Catholic priest that came to her family. And he said, I can easily get you in, but you will have to leave your faith and become a Catholic. This is the way it was in the Soviet Union. And there's a lot of historical documentation that proves that the Roman Catholic Church, they did flourish. They were the, really the only accepted religion in an atheistic country. A lot of us never thought about it this way. I never did either until I started doing a lot of research to realize that they were using atheist, atheistic beliefs with Marx or with Stalin and Lenin in order to stomp out any other religion that doesn't agree with them. So when we're looking at right now, Putin is there, you know, there's been, I've had several emails sent to me about Putin and that he is not allowing the freedom of religion any longer. Could it be that he's trying to stop the spread of a Jesuit influence? Because we know that he's not going to stop the Russian Orthodox faith, at least that one thing we can see for sure. Everybody thinks he's going back to communism, to atheistic belief. But I think what it is, is Vladimir Putin, and this is just a personal opinion, I can't say it's correct, because I do believe that we should have freedom of religion no matter where it is in the world. Even if you want to be a Roman Catholic, I believe you should be free to choose what you want to believe. But I think that Vladimir Putin is very fearful of seeing a repeat of history of the Jesuits gaining control of his country once again. Here's something else to think about. This is from myweb.ecu.edu. In 1829, the Department of Public Instruction recommended a revision of the calendar to the Academy of Science. The Academy proceeded to petition the government to accept the Gregorian calendar. Prince uh, Levan, in submitting the plan to Tsar Nicholas I, denounced it as premature, unnecessary, and likely to produce upheavals and bewilderments of mind and conscience among the people. He further declared that the advantage from a reform of this kind will be very small and immaterial, while the inconveniences and difficulties will be unavoidable and great. The Tsar, being apprehensive, wrote on the report, the comments of Prince Levin are accurate and just. From this onward, frequent attempts were made to remove the ban, but to no avail. They used the Julian calendar. Which, by the way, the Julian calendar, um, I can't, I don't consider it necessarily a good calendar, but it was a calendar that they used. The Gregorian calendar was very much backed by the Pope of Rome. As we close out here, the Orthodox Church was, spe was a special target of the Soviets. For 70 years, the Soviet relentlessly attacked the Orthodox Church. That's the Russian Orthodox Church. The Orthodox priests were their special targets. Many were sent to the Gulag, and most of the churches and schools were closed. It was the longest sustained persecution of the entire history of the world. So we ask the question, why is Ukraine so contested today? According to both Soviet and Western sources, in the late 1980s, the Russian Orthodox Church had over 50 million believers, but only about 7,000 registered active churches. Over 4,000 of these churches were located in the Ukraine Republic. You see, they tried to stomp out the Russian Orthodox religion. They did it through 
sending Jesuits in and turning the country into an atheistic country. There's a lot more evidence to support that, and I don't have the time to go into it on this broadcast. But we're seeing a religious war fought in Ukraine. The problem in Ukraine is there's still a huge Russian Orthodox community there. It's the one place the Russian Orthodox survived and flourished. And the Roman Catholic Church would love to stomp it out. No wonder why they want to annihilate these people. It's a crying shame. And only through media and through educating ourselves of the horror of the war in Ukraine, East Ukraine, what is about to happen, we are the only ones that have a voice to put a stop to what's fixing to happen, which is only going to be worse. And to think the Obama administration is backing this and backing this government lets us know just how strong of a Roman influence is, is over the United States. It could spin the entire world into a third world war. Will Vladimir Putin allow them to annihilate these Russian people that are trying to live their own lives privately? They say that it's Russian soldiers there fighting against the Ukrainians. No, they're only trying to keep them from invading into eastern Ukraine where these people are trying to live at peace. I said to you at the end of this broadcast, I would show you the satellite footage. Let me just show you this. And I've done this before, but I think it's very important for you to see this again. We go to Google Maps. Google Maps lets you go to Google Earth. And I've showed you guys this before, but I'm going to show it again. Right here near Prague is where we are. Prague, right over here, you come down here to just north of Romania. Sorry, it's just over to the right. Prague is a huge country. And just way over here, this bottom little corner here, the Donetsk and Luhansk region. This is the two little cities that wanted their autonomy. All right, as we zoom in on the Donetsk, the city of Donetsk, I'm going to move it to Google Earth. It is a big city. You see, you can see the airport beginning to appear at the top of the city. All right, just so happens since the war, They've upgraded, updated these photographs on your screen. You see the bombed out airport? That was a brand new international airport. It's been totally, totally bombed out. You can see the shell holes, the wings, everything totally destroyed, right? Now, they say that they don't target civilians. Let me back out of the airport here. Okay? You can see right here, you can see a looks like possibly a river of some sort there. You get lakes in there. Let me take you down. This is just one of many, many neighborhoods. This is a neighborhood, guys. Okay. Now, let me see here. I don't know how well you can see this on your screen. The homes. Now, a, a regular house with the roof still intact is right here. You have two houses there. You can still see a bomb hole in the top of this house here, and I know you guys don't see that very well. All right, but you can see that. These houses are totally destroyed. This whole entire neighborhood, you know? I mean, there's like nothing left of this neighborhood, guys. It's, it is astonishing to me. Same thing with this one, nothing. Everything is destroyed. Now, we have a few houses in here on this side of the lake that survived the bombs. But as you go along, that's all you see is just devastation. Even, let's see, over here, another neighborhood here. These are all bombed out. There's much smaller homes in here. Apartment buildings, everything you can imagine. Um... 
totally gone. Now these here, this neighborhood here, it looks like it, it stayed intact fairly well. Um, but you can go to different places and look and see, but especially near the airport, you can just really see it just all blown up and stuff. You know, and you just have to start scrolling around. And I've got a really good eye for this type of stuff, you know, seeing that these houses here all seem to be okay. And now the thing is, though, it's, it's hard to tell because when Google does their putting all these things in, where they put in these new photographs, we may have some that are, that are actual, the real deal, and some that are not. Uh, so you can see right here the darker green in your line here. This here was a new photograph added to their screen. So whether or not the other stuff is or not, I don't know. I don't know what they're putting in, what they're not putting in. But it just so happens, though, that we're able to see some of the horrors of war right here. You've been watching Israeli News Live. Thank you.